Good evening, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Michael Grouske, and I am one of the AF Fellows this year. Today, more than any time in recent history, college campuses seem to have taken a newfound place on the front lines of the national political discourse, and Claremont is certainly no exception to this trend. For a variety of reasons, there appears to be a broad national appetite for the latest developments in student life across the country, and more generally, um, across the country more generally, and uh, here as well. Um, and in the wake of last week's events, this process has manifested as student newspapers have their articles picked up by national news outlets, in some cases providing an accurate picture of events, and in other cases providing a narrow, um, a, a narrow and more politicized narrative. Tonight's speaker, J. Stephen Nordlinger, is a senior editor with the National Review, and he will discuss his views on the politicization of college campus life. Mr. Nordlinger writes on a variety of issues, including politics, foreign affairs, and the arts. He is the music critic of The New Criterion, the author of Peace, They Say, A History of the Nobel Prize, and Children of Monsters, a study of the sons and daughters of dictators. A native of Michigan, Mr. Nordlinger currently lives in New York. As always, audio and visual recording is prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Nordlinger to the Athenaeum. Thank you. It's the first time I've ever been introduced with my middle name. I kind of like it. But, um, someone said they got it from the internet. So um, tonight I'm J. Stephen Nordlinger. My grandparents would enjoy that. Um, <clears throat> I've loved being here. Thank you so much. Thank you for this wonderful food. I've had a great day. I crashed a class of Professor Shields, which is a lot of fun, and did a podcast with Zach and Bryn, so there was a little taste of stardom, and then talked with the way cool Sam Minter, and so it's been very nice. I appreciate the hospitality, and I'd like to uh, enroll. I know everyone says that. I remember when I was in college, older people would say, gee, I wish I could do it over again, and I'd do it differently, and we kind of roll our eyes and yeah, yeah, yeah. But I would, um, I now know what they meant. I, uh, I would love another crack at it. And I'd love to do it here. And <clears throat> I heard from uh, a reader of National Review who knew I was going to Claremont. And he is an, an alumnus of, of Claremont McKenna. And the way he put it was, I majored in Kessler, meaning Charles Kessler. And I would love to come here and major in Kessler and, and other things. I, uh, my idea is that, maybe a little idealistic, you should do a little of everything in college, study a little of everything, with a major, of course, and some mix of science and arts and sports and that kind of thing. Uh, I, I'm all for a, a balanced college life, if you will. And <clears throat> I wonder whether politics is a part of this. And. Uh, my talk has a title. By the way, this is, you may be able to tell, this is an informal talk, but it does have a title. Uh, Politics on Campus, Yes and No. And I say mainly no. I'm sure this is shaped partly by my own experience. Uh, I was sort of a budding conservative student on a pretty left-wing campus, and the politics were toxic and ideological and harsh and unforgiving and intolerant. And I think that, um, that maybe put me off campus politics for life. Uh, it may be strange to hear someone like me <coughs> be uh, anti-political in certain contexts because I am such a political person. I'm a political journalist, a political junkie, sort of a political nut, and sort of drunk on politics and have been for a very, very long time. And I eat, breathe, and sleep it. And I think that may, be, that may make me more appreciative of those moments of relief, though, then those spheres of relief from politics. And if I had my way, colleges would be essentially a places of learning, of study, of contemplation and argument, yes. Uh, it's such a brief experience in the span of a life college, and, and there's so much time for politics later, so much time for political activism. And if I had my way, people in college ought to be building their knowledge. There's time for opinions later, even. I just think, I think students should shove all the learning they can into themselves and just feast at a kind of academic banquet and be exposed to all sorts of things and all 
points of view, left, right, and, and center. Um, I'm not sure you could have told me all this when I was in college, because I thought I was pretty smart and I knew a lot about politics, and, um, but I knew a lot more later. And also, your views may change. Um, I think of that expression they use on airlines, um, be careful opening the overhead bin, items might have shifted in transit. Uh, views can shift as well. Um, so I, uh, my idea of college might be a little bit antiquated, but I think you should read and learn like banshees. I wish I had done more of that. Uh, it is like making deposits into a bank, a great bank, that you withdraw from throughout your life. And I sometimes say this about my reading. I exaggerate a, a little bit, but <clears throat> I sometimes say that I, I, I read like crazy from about age zero to 30, and have hardly read anything since. There's just no time. And uh, another line I use, maybe it's an excuse, is you can't write and read at the same time. You have to do one or the other. But I did all of this reading for many, many years, and I find that I draw on it in my work and in various projects. And I'm glad I did that because adult life, if you will, career life can be so, so crowded. I was saying to some people earlier today, I'm really not sure why a college campus has to be a venue for activism. Uh, I think it should be essentially a, a venue for learning and discovery and maturation. Uh, I remember Abby Hoffman, the 1960s radical, remarked bitterly about campuses in the 1980s. I think they're hotbeds of social rest, he said. And it's good to have hotbeds of social unrest, right? Well, I know, what's the, I'm not as high on unrest as a lot of people are. I think life can be tough enough navigating life, you know, personally. Uh, your friends, your parents, your siblings, your classmates, grades, boyfriends and girlfriends, all that stuff. I don't see what's so great about extra unrest. I think there's enough of it myself. <clears throat> uh, I, I see that um, this is a very quiet night. There are no protests or anything. It's almost insulting. I'll, uh, <clears throat> I, I, I guess I'm, um, I don't know, I don't, I don't mean to bore you. I, I, could, I, could, I could be provocative if you, if you like. So Asher was saying, what about the events of last week? And we had a discussion at our table. <clears throat> Personally, um, and I, I was recalling my, my college years. I think in my years in college, we had about two right of center speakers on campus. And there, were, there was almost a riot on each occasion. One was Al Haig, I remember. And I thought, you know, 45 minutes from a conservative, you know, once every two years, it's really not a lot. Uh, that sort of thing should be tolerated. I, as I put it to Asher, I, I don't believe I have the right to keep anyone else from hearing a speaker. I don't have that right. Um, and I think I should be ex expelled, frankly, or put on some kind of probation if I prevent other people from hearing a speaker. I think it's wrong, it's undemocratic, it's un-American, it's illiberal, um, to use an old word. <clears throat> I wanted to say something about professors and politicized professors. I hope you don't have any here. I had a few when I was in college and maybe graduate school. I can't quite remember. It's been a while. But um, I know that there are professors who abuse their lecterns and turn them into political platforms. And I sort of loved the ones who, who didn't. And I greatly prized a couple of professors of mine who are on the left, but they were so patient with me, with my budding conservatism. I was a, a budding Reaganaut in the uh, early and mid-1980s, and they were sort of sweet with me and teased me a bit. I remember one professor, Barbara J. Fields, later became quite famous historian of the U.S., especially the American South. She won a MacArthur Genius Grant. She was a self-declared Marxist-Leninist at the time. She's quite conservative in many ways, but she was so patient with me, and I so appreciated it. And I remember, too, a, a professor of English named Emily Cloyd, who taught Johnson and Boswell in their circle. And I felt I could talk to her. And I said how, you know, conservatives were discriminated against and they got such a bad rap and so on. 
She said, I know just what you mean. I think she'd gone to Columbia. She was an older woman when I was a student. And she said that when she read the Nation magazine, which is on the left, she would <clears throat> hide it in other material because it was so frowned on in her environment. And it reminded me a line of William Sapphire, the late politico and writer and columnist from the New York Times, who said that he had to go down to the corner newsstand to buy a Hustler magazine so as to have something respectable to hide his National Review in. And I, I remember, I, I, even to this day, as you can tell, I am grateful for these professors on the other side who were uh, patient with me. I, I, I recall that I once spoke to the College Republicans, College Republican Club at Stetson University in DeLand, Florida. And these kids, um, apparently to be a club, an official club, you had to have a faculty advisor. It was required. And there was not a Republican on the faculty. So the chairman of the poli-sci department, a Democrat, readily agreed to be their faculty advisor so that they could have their club. And I thought that was the nicest, most democratic with a small d, most ecumenical thing. And um, that is very much the kind of professor I, I prize. We had a little disagreement at my table, friendly disagreement. I, I brought up um, an old phrase, expression, even a slogan from my college years, the personal is the political. And this I rejected emphatically. I, I think it's indicative of a totalitarian mindset, the idea that everything is suffused with politics. And one of the reasons I'm a so-called conservative, I, basically, I think I'm essentially a, a liberal, but in my time and place, liberals were labeled conservatives and right wing and even worse. But I think one of the reasons I am, let's call it a conservative, is that <clears throat> I do, do believe in spheres free of politics and that politics does not need and must not pervade everything. I'll give you a brief example. Many years ago, a friend and I had a friendly discussion, as friends should, and uh, he's from Vermont. And um, he's um, Ignat Solzhenitsyn, the middle son of the writer, pianist, and conductor. And we both, uh, we're both conservative and anti-communist, and we both like ice cream a lot. We talked about Ben and Jerry's, the Vermont ice cream, you know, Cherry Garcia and all that, kind of a lefty company. And we said, should we mind? We decided, no, you know, we're not Bolsheviks. We're not going to make eating decisions based on politics. We like the ice cream. Uh, we, I'm not, we're not going to politicize our ice cream eating, and so we each had, we each, <clears throat> by the way, at the time, we probably still do, we considered a pint a serving, basically, so we each had a pint, just basically a serving, and, <clears throat> and ate, and I wrote about this once, and people said, well, you know, the company gives to causes that I disapprove of, therefore I'm not going to buy their product and contribute to their coffers, that I can understand, but I just don't want to be, I'm a pretty political person, but I don't want to be so very political that I can't, you know, have me my Cherry Garcia, if you know what I mean. Um, <clears throat> these are very hard times in my little world, the conservative political world. Uh, we are schismatic, at least to a degree, and um, alliances are strained or broken. Friendships are strained or broken. Longtime friends aren't talking to each other. It's just so awful, and um, I suppose it can't be helped. But I must say, I, I, I very much regret it. Uh, certain I hope that friendships can be above politics, but I see in practice that they often can't be. Like Charles Kessler's old friend and my old friend, Bill Buckley, William F. Buckley Jr., was famous for his cross-political friendships. He was a dear friend and skiing companion of John Kenneth Galbraith, uh, the leading socialist economist uh, in the country. And they loved each other, and they debated each other, and teased each other. Bill was also a close friend and skiing companion of Milton Friedman, the libertarian who was Galbraith's opposite. But um, even so political a person as Bill Buckley had time and had a need for friendships and other relationships that transcended politics. It's so easy to factionalize, I was saying earlier today, um, of course, there are left-right battles, but there are certainly a great many intra-right battles, and I'm sure intra-left battles. Uh, I, I suppose it's natural. Um, I think one reason, and I'll address this later when I talk about the media, 
I think everyone is reading his own stuff. That lefties read left stuff and righties read right stuff. It used to be we all read certain things in common, and I, I for one, am glad about the what you might call the, the, the demonopolization, the breakup of, of monopoly on the media. But there was something good about it. We read the same stuff, watched the same programs, and then argued about it. Now everyone curates his own media, and it's sort of hard to talk with one another because we can't even settle on facts. And I think facts have to come first before opinion. At any rate, <clears throat> I was saying, uh, I think to Professor Shields' class earlier today, that a few years ago I went to Hillsdale College, a conservative institution. Uh, I call it Our Harvard, a uh, conservative college. I was talking to the students, the faculty there, and said, what do you all talk about? And you know, you're all conservatives. And Oh, no. No, no, no. Um, so traditional conservatives fight with libertarians. And even more, I was told, Protestants fight with Catholics. Oh, great, religious wars on campus, all we need, just wonderful. And so I, I, I suppose it's natural. I, I thought of an old joke, you may know it. I'm going to tell it anyway. You know about the guy who was stranded on the desert island for years, and he survived. He was finally rescued by a U.S ship, U.S. Navy, the captain goes ashore, and the guy, the stranded guy, who's lived on this de desert island, he wants to show him around before they leave, and the fellow has built a kind of village, a little town, out of whatever materials were available, and he's got a school and a store and a city hall, maybe, and a church, and there are two synagogues. And the naval captain says, I, I can't help it. Why do you have two synagogues? And the man says, well, this is the one I go to. And this is the one I wouldn't set foot in if it were the last place on earth. And this seems to be a kind of human need. Uh, so even at a place like Hillsdale, you have factions, rivalries, and, and so on. About the media, I'm always asking people what they read or watch or listen to. And they often ask me. I used to have answers, very clear answers. I'm not sure I do today, but I must say, certainly for students, I recommend, not that anyone asked me, uh, a diverse media diet. Uh, when I was much younger, I inhaled media. I just loved journalism, and I read everything, uh, papers and, and journals of opinion, left, right, and center, and knew what the arguments were, knew who the personalities were, and that then I decided, um, not necessarily even consciously, I just did. I, I thought some things made more sense than other things. And I think I read five newspapers a day, and they were really newspapers, you know, not just a couple of tweets. And you could spend three or four hours with the Sunday New York Times. And uh, I, I learned a lot from this. And there comes a time to narrow down. Uh, I have a friend, a federal judge in New York, a senior federal judge named Tom Grisey. He said something once, I nicknamed it the Grisey Rule. He said, and he was quite advanced in years at this point, he said, you know, I've read everything for many, many years, decades. I've eaten my vegetables, so to speak. I've done my due diligence. I've read everything. And at this stage, I'm only going to read things I know I'm going to agree with from the git. And I said, I think that's a luxury, maybe, of, and I've been guilty of, of that from time to time. But I do think, I tell myself, uh, that I should have fiber in my diet when it comes to the media, because it's so easy to just to eat candy all day, you know, my, my favorite columnists and so on. And, uh, but I want to know what the rest of the world is looking at and what else there is to look at. And of course, it strengthens you in your own arguments if you know very well the other side's arguments. And I do insist on putting fact before opinion. And it's so great to know things, to be secure in your knowledge of a subject, because opinions are a dime a dozen. But real knowledge, knowledge of facts, for one thing, I, I find that relatively uncommon. I've, I've done a few podcasts now with the AP correspondent in Venezuela, an incredibly brave woman named Hannah Dreyer. I admire her so much. She's in the thick of this chaos and violence of murder and rape. And she's a gentle, sweet person and a quite cheerful one. And I've had her on two or three podcasts where she recounts what is happening. 
and there's really jaw-dropping around her. It's just head-spinning stuff. And a couple of people complain, well, she needs chavismo is the problem and all this, and this inevitable results with socialism and all this stuff, and why doesn't she address that? I think we can do that ourselves. And I'm just so glad that people like Hannah Dreyer exist who tell you what's going on. Um, it's very important there be such people. We can't all be opinion journalists, like I am. I like to think that I discover and report a fair amount of facts myself, but if we were all opinion journalists, we'd be really um, SOL. I, I thought of a remark when I was drawing out my notes that uh, I once heard Marilyn Horne, the great mezzo-soprano, say in a master class. She, kids, she said, kids, get your technique and the world is your oyster. And interpretation is one thing, but that bedrock of technique, the world's your oyster. And I often say this to journalists, that um, a foundation in fact is such a wonderful platform. And I myself am a, a generalist of a journalist. I write about a great many subjects, this essay and that, and this interview and that. And um, you can be a mile wide and an inch deep, you know, and some, so much of my career is so scattershot. And I can talk on almost any subject for a minute, but ask me to go a minute 30, I may have trouble, you know? And it's so nice to be expert on a couple of things. Sort of like having a major. So um, you know, I know a fair amount about music and a fair amount about US politics. I wrote a history of the Nobel Peace Prize. And I've forgotten a great deal of it. But it's so nice to be authoritative on something so that other people can't shove you around. It gives you such a feeling of security, you know, to be almost unchallengeable. And there was a time after I finished that book, this Nobel book, that I, they were, this is not a boast because there are really not many people who seek after this. But I suppose there weren't 10 people in the world who knew as much as I did on the subject. A and the other nine worked at the Nobel Foundation in Stockholm or the Norwegian uh, Nobel Institute in, in, in Oslo. Who cares, right? And now it's gone out of my head like etch a sketch. And I can hardly do a radio interview on the subject. But I once knew a lot about it. And it gives you a wonderful feeling of security. And so I, when I'm asked, I tell others, but mainly I tell myself facts, please, uh, before opinion. I am um, on campus and elsewhere, I, I must say I favor the old liberal values, um, liberal in the older sense. I'm not talking about George McGovern or Barack Obama necessarily, uh, but I mean toleration, pluralism, diversity including diversity of thought. And diversity is such a buzzword and a buzz concept. Usually people mean skin color or maybe sex. And when I was growing up, diversity on campus meant uh, you know, a white Marxist, a black Marxist, a Chicano Marxist, an Aleutian Marxist. And that's no kind of diversity that I respect, really. Um, I think campuses should be, have reflect a diversity of opinion and a free and unfettered exchange of ideas. Now that's just a platitude, but sometimes there arise these occasions for, for platitudes. I was telling some people earlier that I went to, I knew a couple of kids at Brown University, especially one, and they were ready to come out to me. And they had started an underground group where you could talk about issues without fear of ostracism, being shouted down and called names and so on. And uh, they created a secret Facebook group called Reason at Brown, that at sign. And they were having the kind of discussions underground that people ought to have above ground. But they couldn't have these discussions above ground. It was too dangerous. It was too risky. And you know, this is on a college campus in the United States. And that, that not, ought not to be. Uh, someone here said that you, you all have some or had something similar. And I, I don't really see why that has to be. Um, I think people should be open and respectful and shouldn't be fearful of the sort of political police breathing down their neck and so on, or the language police. I wasn't all that brave and bold when I was in college or graduate school. You know, as now, I was pretty mouthy, so you couldn't shut me up entirely. But I said a few things. And then there were people I nicknamed scurriers because they would scurry up to you later and say, I really like what you said, and then scurry away before anyone could see them. 
And um, I mentioned this once to Thomas Sowell. I said, do you have this? Do you have these scurriers? He said, oh yes, I call it private support. As in, uh, I'm right behind you, Tom, way behind you. There will always be these scurriers. But I also learned that if you say something, especially something unorthodox, something that cuts against the grain, you might give great comfort to other people who won't say it. And you may never learn this. They may tell you later. They may tell you at the time. But you may never know it. So when you say something that doesn't seem to be very popular or you seem to be alone, I find you're pretty, you're probably not alone. You're speaking for others who are maybe slightly shyer. I have found, maybe this is another platitude, that um, great ill comes from going with the flow. It's so easy to go with the flow. I've seen this on my own side, the right also. It, it, and it's very hard to, to get biblical on you, to come out from the world and be separate. Uh, sometimes I really think that um, man is a herd animal and, and peer pressure is such a powerful force. And by the way, it remains deep into adulthood I have found it's not just a juvenile thing, it's not just a youth thing, peer pressure. I, the peer pressure stays. I, I, and I find that majorities can be quite bullying. I hate bullying. A conservative majorities can be bullying, and, and left-wing majorities can be bullying. And I have, have often been in a minority. I've, um, sometimes I joke about running for office which I once entertained, and then I would list the places where I've lived. Um, born and raised in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Georgetown, DC, and the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And my punchline is the Republic is safe from me. So um, I've often been in, in certainly a political minority, and I am used to it. And this may make me extra sensitive to other political minorities. Um, once in a while, I'll, I'll give a talk to a conservative group. I was, do this a lot on book tours. And unfortunately, because my books aren't necessarily political, they're conservative groups, because they're the groups that would book someone from the National Review. And so there's, let's say, you know, 40, 50, 80 rock-ribbed conservatives in front of you. But then there's a sound guy, an, or an audiovisual guy, with a ponytail, maybe and a guy behind the bar at the back. And I can see them, and no one else can. And I found myself altering my remarks because of it. Um, omitting certain jokes, for example, or certain barbs, or certain super partisan language, because I don't want to offend them. I still make my point. And I can see them looking at me intently. And this has an effect. I was telling some people, you know, I wouldn't put a bumper sticker on my car, for example, because I wouldn't want to impose my view on people going down the road. And then you might say to me, quite rightly, well, Jay, you have a platform. You constantly write in public. And I, I get that. I get that entirely, that people have a need to express themselves on T-shirts and so on. But I, I think that people ought to be free of my political opinion if they want to be. Um, I will uh, sing a little kumbaya now. I, I think we all should, I think we should be gentler with one another. We should cut one another slack, uh, be tolerant, forgiving. We say the wrong thing, express a dumb opinion, use the wrong word. Oh, you got my pronouns wrong. So what? Um, I'm for cutting one another slack. And if you're going to be in public, we all have to get along to a degree without, of course, compromising on our most deeply held principles. Um, conservatism, and sometimes I think I'm more of a radical at heart, because I'm such a partisan SOB, but um, conservatism, and Professor Kessler and others can correct me if this is wrong, includes temperance. And Bill Buckley liked to, to quote that, that statement attributed to Talleyrand, um, Surtout pas trop de zèle. Above all, not too much zeal. And I've found in my life, including recently, there are periods of my life when I've been consumed by politics. Consumed by it. Go to bed at night shaking over politics. Wake up in the morning shaking over it. That is a lousy way to live. Take it from me. <laughs> Don't be like me. It's a lousy way to live. 
to be an ideological robot and consumed by politics. Now, I like politics a lot, more than most people do. I'll give you a Reagan anecdote. Nancy told it, Mrs. Reagan told it. This is during the governorship, I think, or maybe between the governorship and the presidency. And they go to someone's house for dinner, and the hostess says, you know, it's going to be great. We're not going to talk about politics all night. And the Reagans turn to each other and say, what are we going to talk about? It's what we like to talk about. I like to talk about it, too. But I hope I know enough to know that politics is not the be-all, end-all. And I want to say something finally about democracy and, and, and the rule of law. And the older I get and the more I study the world and go around and interview people and write, I do realize how, how, how rare democracy, constitutionalism, the rule of law is. There's so much dictatorship in the world, authoritarianism, uh, an arbitrary quality, whimsy on the part of the powerful, an interested rather than a disinterested judiciary, and so on. I, our system is pretty rare, and I must say I was so I wrote a book about dictators and their children, and I was so impressed by South Korea the other week. Um, so there was the South Koreans democratically elected a president. That's a pretty rare thing in the world, by the way, democratic to elect a leader. They elected this woman, no less, to the presidency. A democratically elected legislature impeached her. This impeachment was upheld by a legitimate a true enough constitutional court, and she left. You say, big deal, Nixon left. Yeah, well, it's not a big deal here in America. It's a very, very, very big deal in other parts of the world. And contrast South Korea with North Korea. As Gene Kirkpatrick said, that psychotic state, a brutal dynastic dictatorship with a horrific gulag. It's probably the worst place on earth, along with Syria now, who have had two Assad's ruling since 1970. And think about the Koreans on that peninsula. They're the same people, they have the same DNA, they speak the same language, they have the same traditions, same food to the extent the North Koreans can eat, and so on. Same, same, same. What's different? Uh, the political system, government. And you can consider the two Germanys during that 40 years, whatever it was, as well. This kind of thing matters. And you'll hear a lot, including from people on my own side, that you know, some people simply aren't fit for democracy. They like or need an authoritarian hand. And it was said about uh, Asians and, 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 and people making excuses in ages and autocrats and their supporters said, well, you know, we have Asian values. Liberal democracy, that's just an Anglo-American fetish, you know. We have Asian values. It's much different. The South Koreans and the Japanese and the Filipinos and others put the lie to that. This was also said about um, Southern Europeans. Spaniards, for example, they worshiped throne and altar. Liberal democracy was, that was an Anglo thing. No, nonsense, nonsense. And the same excuses are now made for Russia and other places in the world. So I was an anthropology major. I love human differences. In fact, I spend probably 95% of my time writing about human and national and social differences. <clears throat> but there are also um, commonalities that I take note of. And finally, I just want to say, I think it's about time for me to have the hook. Um, no one likes to hear how good they have it. It's so annoying. Some people say to me, oh, you get to do these things. You have it. And I just, you know, yeah, buzz off, right? And so you may be sick of hearing how wonderful Claremont is and what a privilege it is to be here and all that jazz, you know, yeah, 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 it's normal life. But um, it really is a, a wonderful place, and I trust that you are taking full advantage. Now, in this little Q&A, we can talk about whatever we want. Um, talk about politics, we can talk about politics on campus, or music, or dictatorship, or what have you. It's absolute open mic night. So I think I need to be done. I thank you all so much. We now have time for questions and answers. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and Sarah or I will come to you. If you're called on, please stand and introduce yourself before asking the question. Uh, hi, thank you so much for your talk. You wouldn't be Alec Lopato, would you? 
I am. Ladies and gentlemen, Alec Abar. <laughs> uh, so you, in your talk, talked a lot, or n not a, a ton, but you, you mentioned the, vet, the virtue of ideological diversity on campus and having people from both sides on campus. And I think by virtue of us being at CMC, I think most students in the room would agree that that's a, a good thing to have. Let me interject for a second. Mm -hmm. Professor Shields told me today that he assigns readings from the left and the right on the same subject. He must be one of a handful of people in the whole country who do this. I am so impressed. I don't think I ever had that. Anyway, please. Yeah, so I think that's a virtue we all have, but what I'm struggling with is you also advocated for campuses to be an apolitical environment, for us to learn and not in, not necessarily engage in political activism. So I'm wondering what value there is to having an ideologically diverse campus where people are representing both sides if they're not actually going to engage in activism and advocate for the side they believe in. I'm for an honest teaching of subjects. I'm, from, I'm for an exposure to a diversity of views. I think this kind of teaching is very, very important. A friend of mine spoke at a little college in Minnesota, and he was escorted to and from the airport by a young woman who was majoring in criminology. And she said to him, um, may I ask you something? This is just in private. And he'd met with three classes or something. Has there ever been anything written in favor of capital punishment? And it transpired that this dear girl's uh, sister or brother had been murdered years ago, and this was obviously stamped her. She was majoring in criminal justice. And she had a feeling that there was an argument, a moral argument, for the death penalty. But no one had ever assigned her anything like it. That ought not to be. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. And look, if students want to engage in politics, who am I to stop them? I just think there are better uses of collegiate time. And there's loads of time later for political activism, for left-right fighting. Who knows how you even wind up? You know? That's the kind of thing I mean. But as I said, you could not have told me that when I was a college student. No way. Don't be shy or I'll call and you'll come out in the audience like Oprah. You know? uh, my name is John Morris. I'm a parent of a CMC student. And I have a couple questions if I could sneak them in. If you could pick three people in the world that you could interview, who would they be and why? And the second question is if you could wave a magic wand and that person could be President of the United States, who would that be? Hmm. I used to have an answer to that question back in the 90s, I think. I'm talking about the latter question. And because we'd all play this game. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> I'd say, well, you, know, you can't nominate your grandfather, let's say. It's got to be someone in political life or in the public sphere. I did have an answer. I, uh, I wouldn't give those answers today. I used to say uh, Henry Hyde or Bill Bennett, who were so well-rounded and so sound, I thought. That was then. Today, I was saying to the class earlier, I am the type, I've been cured, but I sort of fall in love with politicians. Bad move. And I think of the biblical, put not your trust in princes. Um, I like, I loved Ronald Reagan to an almost embarrassing, idolatrous degree. Um, I started out very anti, but I switched pretty early in the first term. Not long after the assassination attempt, actually. Um, presently, <clears throat> I love Ben Sass, the senator from Nebraska. Um, but as the late Bill Rusher said, longtime publisher of National Review. A politician will always break your heart, and I think that's okay. Politics involves compromises and a great deal of impurity. Politics is not for the pure. Uh, I, I like purity in many areas of life. In, in politics, no. Uh, but you do like a certain steadfastness, right? And um, Ben Sass strikes me as a quite sensible fellow. Um, I don't know. In earlier years, I'd reel off six, seven, eight, nine names. Bing, bing, bing. I, I can't really do that now. Um, interviewees, I've, um, not to be a jerk, but I've interviewed a lot of them. 
a lot of them uh, in politics, uh, in the arts, to a degree in sports. I've interviewed, um, literally, it sounds rhetorical, literally kings and queens, if you count the Jordanians, and presidents and prime ministers and foreign ministers. Uh, Leontine Price, whom I know slightly, has never granted me an interview. He just turned 90. Maybe the greatest singer who ever lived. Um, I have to think about that. Uh, Bill Buckley used to say, that question's like Peking duck, requires 24 hours notice. I'll give you three sterling ones tomorrow morning. Um, I was, uh, being such an egotist, I was, I was bent out of shape when the Prime Minister of Canada, Stephen Harper, declined to sit with me. How dare he? You know, but he, he had a right, right? Um, I'll give you better an, a better answer later. For now, I'll give you Leontine Price. Hey, I exhausted you? Oh, I'm, yes. I'm Samuel. Uh, thanks so much for coming to give your talk here. Um, at the beginning, you talked about colleges as a sort of space where we could put aside activism or put aside politics at times. Um, and I see that as a very privileged attitude. So I wanted to challenge you on that. Huh? Um, what? Well, let me give an example here. So okay. like if you're, let's say, a queer student um, and you're at a very homophobic college, you can't just say, oh, we're going to put aside politics, put aside activism, and just dig into our studies. Um, if you're a survivor at a college that's not holding perpetrators accountable, you can't just put that aside and dig into your studies. Um, and so just more generally, like if you're from a privileged positionality, a privileged background, it's a lot easier to just disengage with activism and accept the status quo since the status quo has always served you. Um, whereas if you're from a marginalized background, that can be a lot harder. So I was just wondering, how do you respond to that line of reasoning? We, we may have different um, senses of politics. I'm basically talking about left-right battles or inter-left and inter-right battles. I'm not talking about such things as common courtesy, decency, treating other people well. If that's what you mean by politics, I think people should be free from persecution, discrimination, harassment. That's not what I meant by politics. I meant uh, left-right battles over, I don't know, healthcare policy, let's say, or uh, abortion, or capital punishment or the so-called hot but button issues, the things I spend my whole life in. So to follow up on that, um, like a lot of the issues that I referred to there, like the holding campuses to do more to support survivors, that's a somewhat partisan issue. Um, gay rights is certainly been a partisan issue, it still is. So I think, I'm not quite sure how you're defining politics if you don't want to include issues that revolve around identity, since that's a huge part of what the political scene today could in you, America is. Could you, um, I don't mean to be obtuse, could you give me an example? Of an of, issue? Of, of, of a, of a say, political issue that ought to be fought out on campus? Um, like I think either of the ones I just listed, um, racial politics would be another example. Um, like Black Lives Matter is a hugely partisan idea, so. Right. Well, Black Lives Matter, that movement, uh, it is uh, an inflamed issue, obviously. There's a lot to be learned from it, and uh, I think people ought to learn about it and, and from it. I, um, you know, a speaker comes to give a talk, and there's no one more diligent or thoughtful than Heather McDonald, and she's very conscientious person, a Renaissance woman, steeped in music, literature, public policy, other things, and a very considerate person. The idea that she should be shadowed down or blocked from speech is shocking to me. I, mean, I can sort of, if I were shadowed down, that would be one thing, but Heather McDonald? I mean, she weighs about 105 pounds, and she's an immensely refined, civilized person. And uh, I say, if you disagree with her about the police, uh, write a paper or do something. The idea of shouting and pounding and blocking, is, it's, it's illiberal. It, it's 
it's undemocratic. And I don't see why at Cal, I know this is naive or unreasonable, or, I don't see why students can't study. I mean, the, the word student implies studying. I don't see what's wrong with that. I, I don't see why people at a relatively, t forgive me if I'm insulting you, I don't see why people at a relatively tender age have to be in the sort of meat grinder that I live in day in, day out. Why do you need it? I, I, I think of, of college as almost a, almost a sort of a, a, a breathing space or a girding up, a gearing up for life to come. Uh, and as I say, if you feel strongly about something, I mean, no one can shut me up. But I guess this is an old-fashioned phrase. I think there's a time and a place for everything. And I think politics intrudes too often where it doesn't or shouldn't fit. But if you feel yourself embattled, if you feel yourself wronged, I would never stop anyone from fighting back. That's part of being a human being and having rights. But it's a big, bruising, lousy world out there. And I do think places like this, and again, forgive me if this is naive, should be havens of a sort, shelters from the storm, rather than producers of the storm. That's my view of it. When I was in college, everyone was on a knife's edge all the time about the Soviets and <sighs> drug war, uh, Marcos in the Philippines. On and on it went. Um, wars over the curriculum, everything having to do with, with, with race and, and class and ethnicity and, and sex, or as you all would say today, gender. I think that's total BS, but whatever. That's the way the language has flowed. Um, I, I don't think that such an environment myself is conducive to learning. But I know that, I mean, obviously most others disagree because look at the state of campuses. So forgive me if I, I didn't answer that as specifically as I should have. I'd know a lot more if I were on a campus. I'd just parachute in every now and then. I acknowledge. Hi, I'm Asher. Um, just wanted to thank you again for your talk. I enjoyed our conversation as well. And I think, to your point at the end, I think I try to think every day about sort of how fortunate we all are to be on a campus like this and in the situation we're in. And I, I, I appreciate that. Um, there we go. I appreciate that a lot. I just, not to sort of continue on, I'm go sorry, ahead. Samuel's point, um, but just in, in our talk at the table, you spoke about how certain, certain spaces should try to be as apolitical as possible, whether that be a concert or something like that. But <clears throat> I guess to the point is, how do you sort of reconcile that with the fact that certain people's identity is inherently political and therefore can't separate in any situation the, the political from the non-political, if, if I may just... or won't. Well, I, if, I, if I may push back on that a little bit um, earlier... I haven't started pushing. Okay, so go, well, go sure. Um, earlier you mentioned how you should cut people slack if they use someone's incorrect pronouns, but therefore that's implying that somebody's inherent identity and them as a person is political, and so... So, yeah, I guess my question is just how do you reconcile the f which what I think would be good is to have sort of these apolitical spaces um, with the fact that certain people's identity is inherently political and they don't have the privilege to be able to separate sort of their identity f and their being. I don't buy from it, Asher. I don't buy it. I regard it as a choice. Okay. Now, sometimes people force things on you. It's true. But in this environment, in our society, I do think people choose political identities, and they have a perfect right. In part, this is a matter of taste, and my taste goes one way, and other people's tastes go other ways. And so, I wouldn't necessarily block people. I 
I believe in freedom of choice, freedom of conscience. I am expressing preferences. And I think that living 24-7 as a political animal can be exhausting and bad for the health and warping of a person's mind. There comes a time to give it a rest. I once did a piece about the intrusion of politics into articles about sports. I call these safe zone violations. Okay, they're these sports writers who really hold their manhood cheap until they've taken a shot at George W. Bush in an article about hockey or something like that. And I don't see why you have to alienate alienate people in something like that. There are places for politics and places that aren't political. And uh, you know, you go to a concert, and I'm in the concert hall or opera house several nights a, a week, and once in a while, especially in flamed periods, people make partisan remarks from the stage. It's their right. I myself don't like it, and I say so. Linda Ronstadt gave a concert, and she said, anyone Republican here should leave, all Republicans out. Well, she has a right, but I have a right to say, I don't like it. And I think you ought to be able to go to a Linda Ronstadt concert and enjoy her songs. I don't think that politics has to reign on every parade. And I think you will find in what Robert Conquest called non-consensual societies, totalitarian societies, politics reigns on every single parade. You're never free of it. It pervades everything. Uh, employment, education, how many children you can have, uh, romantic relationships. Um, you'll see it all in the lives of others, the film about East Germany by Florian uh, von Donnersmark. And I, I think this is a, a human tragedy. I think freedom from politics is one of the greatest freedoms, and there are a lot of people who do not have that freedom because politics affects their, their livelihood or their very lives. A change in government can mean a midnight knock on the door when there wasn't one. And I was saying earlier, I, this made a great impression on me when I was in college at graduate school during the Salvadoran Civil War. When voting was compulsory, there was a pivotal election. People had to vote and they lined up for miles and these terrorists, these FMLN bastard guerrillas, murdered some of them, came and murdered them. And those people stood in line and stayed there. Politics was very, very important to them, obviously. It made all the difference. It, it meant life and death for them. And in a liberal democratic republic like ours, it doesn't, thank God. And so I think, and I tell myself as much as others, there comes a time to relax and enjoy the blessings of liberty and look at the sunset or take a stroll or go for a milkshake, for God's sake. Um, I, I, I meet many people who are sort of dying from politics, suffering from politics. And also there should be a certain amount of joy and fun in politics. Hubert Humphrey used to talk about the politics of joy. And, uh, and he had some of that. So I don't mean to say, I of all people, do not mean to say that politics is unimportant or we should be indifferent to it. I think that politics should not be allowed to take over. That's what I So tonight, I came to Athenaeum, and I chose to sit at this table. I chose to eat the dessert. I could have not chosen to eat the dessert, but it was a choice that I made, and I think that's a choice that I think perhaps I'm free to make. I'm also a queer individual, and that's not a choice that I've made, not a choice that I ever can make, right? So I want to just address what you said earlier about choosing to not let like po not, not like politics pervade your life in every facet of it, because I think it's quite a dangerous, dangerous sentiment to have, because for me to choose to not let politics pervade my life, or for me to force upon myself the removal of a part of who I am. And you mentioned earlier about enjoying the sunset and going for a milkshake. I think it's all nice and well if, if you can actually do that and permit yourself that luxury. Like it's important for us to recognize that across a number of different ident identities and a number of different pr pr perspectives, people don't always have the luxury of watching that sunset, right? And when you want to say that anyone always has the opportunity in a great system, perhaps that is a liberal democracy, to watch the sunset, I think it's important to recognize that that is not the case. And that Politics and the freedom from politics is a luxury that only comes about when who you are is not, is not an important question, right? And when a who I am remains an important question and remains an ongoing debate still in this country and around the world, I think that a freedom from politics is a luxury that I often cannot afford. And so you said earlier that it can be quite exhausting to always be in politics. I think most people in this room would agree that you were entirely right to say that. But I also, I also think that 
the removal from politics and the entrance into some sort of rest or respite is an even greater luxury than, or than, being in, than, than anything else. Because for many of us, we feel that we have no choice other than to remain in politics because there are still fights that have to be fought and victories that we must win because to be who we are at present is, 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 is not really, in some, some sense, living. Um, and in many ways, uh, is still a battle that we fight every day in our own identities and in our own lives. And so I wanted to just ask about... Hang on a second, hang on. <laughs> I, I'm having trouble understanding you. I spent a lot of my time with dissidents, former political prisoners, human rights activists, people who put their neck on the line all the time. I just spent a couple of hours with Vladimir Karamurza, the Russian democracy leader, who's been poisoned twice, almost died each time. He's in Washington now recovering. He's going back to Russia. I meet with people fresh from the dungeon, people all over the world, mainly from the Oslo Freedom Forum, which is a human rights gathering, people who uh, live in terrible dictatorships, under terrible tyranny, where their choices are quite limited, and they risk so much. I, I, I consider myself really lucky to live in a democratic country, and I think it's very important, we all have problems, but I think it's quite important that our grievances be, um, be real. I, I, I'm not quite sure what to say. I deal with so many people under dictatorship. I spend probably half my writing life doing that. And I'm not exactly sure what you mean. I'm sorry. So I hadn't quite gotten to the question part of what I was saying. Um, but what I wanted to ask before you interrupted me is that you mentioned the importance of respect. And it seems to me that there is a very severe tension between re respecting others and who they are um, and what you said earlier about not wanting to impose your politics on someone else. You mentioned a bumper sticker on your car and that you don't think that you have the right to impose your politics on someone else. And so I wanted to ask, because it seems to me that there's a tension be between those two statements, because who I am is a queer individual and in, s in, in that sense, my very existence is political. And so when I speak to someone and when I meet someone, that necessarily is politics. And I necessarily always impose politics on people when I meet them because of who I am. And I wanted to ask if, uh, just what your view was on that tension between the importance you place on respect for other people and what you would like, which is to say that one should always impose politics on other people. Well, you know, there are people who like politics a lot, including me. And there are people who have conversations about all sorts of things. So I, I think it depends uh, uh, to, a, to a degree on, on personal taste. If you, if you carry politics with you as an intensely political person, you can always find like-minded people and people who will go along with you. Uh, but other people, including me, uh, like a break from politics every now and then. I I've listened to you pretty carefully, I I'm, and forgive me, I'm, I'm not sure I, I, I get it. Are, are you saying that um, you're in some kind of bind that leaves you no choice or under threat or? So I think the point I'm trying to make is that, for example, you mentioned yourself, that you, are, you, you sometimes choose to not inflict politics on, on other people. What Pardon? I want to try Sorry? and say, you mentioned that you yourself do not want to impose politics on, on other people, right? Yeah. And that so you might not if they don't want it. And yeah. so you might not put, let's say, a Republican bumper, bumper sticker on your car. Yeah. The point I am making is that, that you have the freedom to say, I will not put that bumper sticker on my car. Right. And your argument holds when it's merely about putting bumper stickers on cars. What I'm trying to say is that for many people, both in the US and around the world, there is no choice to be made. Because who they are, in and of itself, is necessarily political. And so when I stand in this room, and when I ask this question, and when I speak to you, that is necessarily a political thing for me to be doing. And so it seems to me that I have no choice but to be political, because what I am is in fact political. 
what, what you are is political? Yes. Oh, okay. I wanted to say, first off, thank you for your talk. And I'm going to take my best stab at clearing it up, because at least in my interpretation, and hopefully in that of some of the audience too, you've been asked the same question like a bunch of times in different ways. And it hasn't quite worked. So I'll make my attempt at uh, phrasing it. So I think what Thomas and the previous speakers were trying to say is that it's easy to remove yourself from politics in some cases, and I understand that you're saying that that is at, like a good thing in many cases. But when a person on a daily basis who is, say, Jewish or gay or any number of uh, things that is like controversial politically, and they have to deal on a daily basis with people who say, you should not be able to marry the person you love, or you should not be able to um, worship what you want to worship, or a whole bunch of other things. That I think what they're saying is that it is much harder for them to be removed from politics when on a daily basis they come across people who say, you should not allow, be allowed to be you. Um, I, I hope that worked. I don't know, I'm sorry. Um, my question is really oh, yeah. sorry. sorry. Um, my, my question is related to that, and okay. it's a clarification question. Do you think human rights issues are political? Yes. Yeah. So, like, if people are fighting for equality on this campus, and as educational institutions like CMC and like all the five five colleges, we as educational institution we want we want to we, we have responsibility to educate people that all everyone is equal so if we don't take initiative to do that on campus um, who else is doing that so like my, my opinion is um, that um, he, um, college colleges like all, all the educational institutions should be political because we are the institution who are fighting for human rights movement and like everyone should be equal so like the question is political and um sorry you're the institution fighting for equal rights yes um w what institution like all the universities all right are fighting for equal rights yes good I'm so sorry. I don't know what you mean. I hear your words. I don't know their meaning. What are you talking about? Just say it, Frank. Just say it bluntly. When you say equal rights, you're fighting for equal rights. We. Pardon? Um, you're fighting for equal rights. We're, we're fighting fighting for equal rights. So, is it political? Like, is human rights? Uh, is fighting for human rights political? Well, yes, because, because usually human rights are denied by governments. So, yes. Uh, there are people all over the world who can't uh, express themselves, can't run for office, can't write poetry, and, and so on. And so these human rights activists uh, with whom I am enmeshed are political people and political actors because they're trying to resist tyrannical governmental forces. So, yeah, of course. Hi, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us and um, to have this very productive dialogue as I see it because both in terms of the ideas that it's inspired among my fellow peers as students and also to hear your perspective as someone who's very respected and uh, I've read your writings, I really respect the opinions that you present. Um, I kind of want to push back on this idea that the arts are apolitical because it, what came to mind for me is someone like Wagner. So Wagner 
was a notable anti-Semitic person. All of his writings um, are specifically targeted towards um, Germanic Nazism. He was very much so in history seen as someone who's anti-Semitic. And then in the rise of Hitler, they used his operas, they used um, several phrases in his music to perpetuate Nazi propaganda. If you think about someone counter to him, like um, Gustav Mahler, who literally had his string quartets playing in graves, was deeply morbid, but that morbidity reflected his sadness and the fact that he was Jewish and being denied both residencies as a conductor and performances of very brilliant and um, amazing music just based on the fact that he was from a certain identity. So when you speak about how the arts and how you should be able to go to the opera or go to the symphony or go to the ballet and that those things should be free from political intrusions, it seems almost counter if you, I mean, looking back, that's way far um, in history that those things are still political. The art is still political. And actually the art, in my view, is used as a vehicle to both communicate political ideals um, or to counter political ideals. And so I'm just confused as to where you're getting this idea that some forum should be free and be, should be apolitical when it seems as though even when you're talking about someone as prolific as Wagner or someone as you know beautifully talented and prolific as Mahler, how you can separate from their very identity. So similar to what is, has been said before by previous students about how when one's identity is inherently political. So when you're Mahler and your very identity as a Jewish composer is inherently political and your art therefore reflects it, how do you tease out your identity from these politics and how can you expect someone to do so when you're speaking in the modern context as well? Right, when I was speaking of concerts and opera performances, I was mainly talking about remarks by the performers from the stage, little political speeches, for example, unrelated to the music that's going on. Wagner um, <laughs> was a, a man and a lousy one in many respects and a, a composer. And I've spent a great deal of time on this and I could give you a short answer or a long answer. But let me give you an example of Theodor Herzl, the father of Zionism, who would begin his Zionist conferences in Europe in the late 19th century with the playing of Wagner by a hired orchestra. Why? Because of the music, its universal nature, its transcendental nature. Why have the greatest Wagner conductors at Bayreuth been Lauren Mazel, James Levine, Daniel Barenboim, on and on. Why? I, um, I wrestled these questions a long time ago when I was in my teens, early teens, and a music student. And I found that to the extent possible, and it's not, sometimes it's not possible, music with words, all bets are off. Music without words, um, I just wrote an essay about this. It will drive you nuts if you politicize everything. You mentioned Wagner. How about Chopin? Horrible anti-Semite. Horrible. But he was a Pole and a Frenchman and not German and wrote some songs in Polish, otherwise basically piano music. Uh, what is political about the Siegfried Idol, let's say, or the Wesendonk Lieder? or the Liebestot. You could say the Good Friday music is sort of religious, sort of pagan. If you don't want to listen to Wagner, I don't blame you one bit, or Strauss. There are a lot of bad actors. I like Dmitry Kabalevsky, who was the head of the Composers' Union, the Soviet Union, and is responsible for some persecution of other composers. Not to mention performers. I think of the, all the Nazis, all the communists, Claudio Abbado, Maurizio Pollini, Clemens Krauss, Karl Böhm, Richard Strauss didn't behave so honorably necessarily. And I don't fault anyone if they don't want to listen to that music. I don't. But there is music that is just music. 
I'll tell you what I don't like in the ring. Uh, Mima, I think, is a Jewish stereotype. Um, that is hard to swallow for me. How about the other gods and mortals and Valkyries? There's an old expression, who would skate whipping? If I judged people in the arts, I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't go to anything, because my views are rather unusual. Um, Galina Vishnevskaya, in her memoir of music making the Soviet Union, talks about all these terrible communist moles and informants who really screwed over other people, including some of my favorites, like Elena Obratsova, who behaved terribly. Should I turn a deaf ear to her? Maybe. Mahler had an interesting life. He, he did pretty well as the <laughs> leading conductor in Europe and the head of the Vienna Court Opera. Spent six weeks in the summer compose, composing, converted to Catholicism for professional reasons. So did Schoenberg. Um, is Mahler's music political? There's nine symphonies. Well, the first symphony has some klezmer music in it. Um, Songs of a Wayfarer, Songs on the Death of Children, The Rooket Leader, Song of the Earth. I think it's music. I think it's music. But uh, I know what you mean. When I hear what Wagner said about Mendelssohn, for example, or Meyerbeer, it causes an almost physical reaction, a revulsion. But I had to decide long ago what I was going to do about Wagner, long ago. And uh, Theodore Herzl helped me think it through. This will be our last question. Party pooper, killjoy. Uh, thank you for coming to speak. Um, it was interesting and informative. Uh, you can ask my roommate. I've been a reader of the National Review for some time now. It keeps me sharp. Um, my, I appreciate what you said about how, how fortunate we are to be in this country, in this democracy. I'm from Eritrea, and um, I think I'm acutely aware of uh, countries that don't have the freedoms that we have here. And what's beautiful about America, the promise of America, is that we don't give up when we have good enough. We fight for more, we fight for equality, we fight for justice. And so um, when you say it's, it's good to have ideological diversity on campus, I agree with you, but um, what can we take away from a campus that has ideological diversity but not cultural diversity? What does that tell us about um, sort of the, the type of society we live in? How do we push back against that? And um, another question I have for you specifically about um, the Republican Party, the conservative movement in America is <clears throat> when I, I know the conservative movement has members from all types of demographics in America, but when it's sort of predominantly occupied by one specific demographic and all other demographics are shifted the other way, um, what can we take away from that? Remind me what the first question is. Uh, the first question is, what's the value of uh, having ideological diversity on campus if, yeah. if, if I, I, the success, if the path to success in America is through college and um, we have these great ideological um, debates on campus but it's like poor people don't have access to this or uh, certain minority groups don't have access to it, what's the value of that? The strength of a theory is only good in its, 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 its applicability if how like practical it is. If we have these like ideological values that don't translate into the real world, what's the value of that? Well, um, there's knowledge for knowledge's sake. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, knowledge has a great many practical benefits, but also it would be quite satisfying as a human being simply to know things, because they're true or, or interesting. Um, what will an English major do for you in the marketplace? I don't know, but it might make you a fuller, richer, rounder, more interesting human being. But still you know, employable. Have, pardon? But still employable versus if you didn't have a degree in the first place. Yes. Certainly helps to have a college degree. And so I, that's I, why we push for um, 
these like ideological diversity is uh, uh, certainly of the utmost importance, but that's why I don't think there's a great, myself, I don't, you may have a different experience, I don't think there's a great deal of pushing for political or philosophical diversity. I wish there were more such pushing. Um, and so do you think the push for cultural diversity on campus is misplaced? Cultural diversity, what does that mean? Uh, affirmative action policies, for example, or general pushes to have different minor or cultural groups on campus that um, generally have not been well represented on college campuses. Right. Yes, th th that's a big topic. I think that um, a couple <sighs> private institutions, public institutions, uh, they are a little different. I am for letting a thousand flowers bloom. I think there should be a great diversity of institutions. Um, I think uh, there's room for uh, parochial schools, let's say. There's room for military academies. And this great, vast country, as Bill Buckley would say, sea to shining sea, continental America. There's room for a great many choices. And I don't think that all campuses or universities need to be the same, according to my own ideals. I think there's a place for single-sex institutions. Um, so I'm, as I say, I'm for letting a thousand flowers bloom and letting parents and others choose. Uh, I think that um, people should be exposed to a variety of views, as I've said, and uh, we have our own life experiences. As far as the Republican Party is concerned, I, I think it's uh, in a time of flux. Of course, maybe we're, we're always fluxing. Um, we have a two-party system. It's pretty much always been this way with parentheses of exceptions. Uh, it seems like, some, used to strike me when I was younger that there ought to be more than two parties in this vast country with hundreds of millions of people, why two main parties? Uh, but it has worked out pretty well for us. They're fairly wide tents. tents. One is right-leaning and one is left-leaning. And they have their day, they rise and fall. I've learned about the cyclical nature of politics. I never liked hearing about this, but later I became a believer in it. I remember when the Labour Party was, was vanquished in, in Britain at, by Thatcherism, conservatism, and they were going the way of the dodo. And then Labour won was it four elections in a row, and the Tories were dead as a doornail. Uh, then the Tories won again. I remember here in America that um, that um, Reagan and Reaganism had vanquished the Democratic Party. Uh, it was a rump party um, uh, held up by three pillars. What was it? Hollywood, public sector labor unions, and something else. And the Republicans had, hmm? I'm talking about the, the, the Democrats. And the Republicans had vanquished. And, and, then, and then the Republicans were never going to win again. And so it, it ebbs and flows. Uh, the Trump phenomenon, I think, um, I think it, it is a phenomenon, and I think it's individual, and I don't know whether his political voodoo, if you will, what he has politically, can transfer to other people. I think the Trump movement may be more Trump himself, but future elections will, will tell us that. Uh, the country's pretty sharply divided. It was a very close election. One person won in the Electoral College, and the other person won in the popular vote. Republicans now have great leads in the governorships and the state legislatures, and a healthy lead in the House, and a smallish lead in the Senate. But I've learned just by hanging around that these things can change very, very quickly. And uh, as I say, I don't, I don't mean to be um, go gooey on you, uh, but to live in a constitutional republic is a special thing so that changes of government are not that jarring. The way some people put it, using a football analogy, is that politics in America is played between the 40-yard lines, and that's a little boring, but I've spent a great deal of time in, and even more studying, and writing about um, uh, countries where politics are extreme. And so the older I get, the better boring looks to me, if you know what I mean. Uh, exciting politics may seem kind of cool on paper, it is horrible in practice, as people all over the world can tell you. Thank unfortunately, you very unfortunately, that is all the time we'll have for questions. Please join bye me bye. in thanking Mr. North. Thank you.